All right, how many of you have already written grants? Have done funding already? Okay. So some of this might be confirming what you already know. Um, some I hope will be helpful. My teaching and presentation style is interactive. Um, so we're gonna be doing um, some group work in a little bit so that you actually get to uh, see some examples of successful proposals that have been funded and I'll also talk about components of um, grant writing and look at some examples on the PowerPoint, okay? All right, so what is that? Can you tell? What is it? A vacuum cleaner, all right, okay. How many of you have used one? All right. So, what is the purpose of a vacuum cleaner? Can you speak up so that people can catch you? To clean, okay. What? To clean the floor, okay. Um, I want you to look at this vacuum cleaner and tell me what's special about it. Portable, okay. What kind of vacuum cleaners have you used in your life? You said you've used them. So what have you used? What kind? Non-portable, the ones you roll on the floor? Okay. Um, heavy, light, bag, bagged, or have a filter where you just throw out the, the dirt. Okay. So this one is a little different because it is portable and people are trying to say this is a better way to clean the house. So I want you to think about you as someone who has to sell this product. Okay? You are selling this vacuum cleaner, this new and improved somewhat uh, high-tech cleaner. What would you say to someone? So what I want you to do is at your table, I want you to divide in two groups. So if you're, you know, three and two or four, two and two, whatever, just sort of divide yourselves in somewhat halves. And half of you will be trying to sell this product. The other half will be saying, no, I don't want this product. And we'll come up with all kinds of reasons not to buy it. You don't want this new product because you're happy with what you have. You like the rollers, or you like sweeping, or you, know, you don't like vacuum cleaners, and you just want to be real fashion about it. So, Divide yourselves in half and decide who's going to be the pro of this, who's trying to sell it, and who's trying not to buy it, okay? And so this is what you're going to think about. What is the purpose for those of you who are selling this? What is the purpose of your product? It's supposed to suck dirt. Plain and simple, right? Okay. Why is it different from other vacuum cleaners? I want you to think about why your product is special, okay? And you're starting to see what this has to do with grant writing. This is the whole process of proposal writing is telling people why you're different, okay? What's in it for the customer, all right? So again, in half or so, decide who's going to sell the vacuum and think of all those things first. So I want you to take turns talking about that and then hear from the other group to say why they don't want your product. All right? Five minutes, go. Okay. Let's hear from those of you. How did you solve this vacuum cleaner? Who wants to share? How did you convince your peers this is the best vacuum cleaner on earth? Who wants to share? Come on, sales folks. They told us it was lightweight. It was lightweight? Okay. Why is that important? Why should I care if it's lightweight? Because it's on your back. It's on your back? Okay. All right. Okay. So why is it important to have something on you versus just pushing around the machine? What is it? That's final alignment, so you're bringing some science into this. Very good. What else? What else? Pro vacuum. 
yes it's easy uh, easier to back on staircases with this because mm -hmm. you don't have to like yes yeah, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yes, absolutely <laughs> right. I'm it, okay excellent i think for me that's probably one of the best reasons uh, <laughs> for, that it, it is so uh, versatile so as i mentioned people don't really associate writing proposals with marketing and selling but I really want you to think of writing your proposal, doing a research, whether it's for a university fellowship like the Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship or the Interdisciplinary Dissertation Fellowship or anything that's external to the university, that is what you are doing. You are persuading a group of people to say you have the best product, best idea, the best approach, the best whatever. And a part of that is knowing what's already out there. How do you know you're the best if you don't know what's out there? Okay, so that's why I told you to think about what vacuum cleaners have been used in the past, and why is this special? Okay, so just the thought process of what we call persuasive writing. And that is what proposal writing is. There's all kinds of genres of writing, right? You know that from, you know, effective writing when you're in college. Proposal writing is in the category of persuasive writing. You are there to sell something. Okay? Your experience, your ideas. So put another way, let's say you want to be fluent in another language. I want you to think of a language that you really want to be fluent in. Okay? Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, whatever. Why do you want to learn this new language? Is it required for your graduate program? Maybe future career you want to work in that particular region of the world or you know you can be interacting with people from that part of the world. And you want practical experience in another country. So you're not just online learning Japanese. You actually want to go to Japan. You actually want to go to a particular country where they speak this language, okay? Not simply three courses and tutorials. So, an example of a foundation, this is um, hypothetical. So the Global Explorations Foundation offers graduate students 15,000 to study a new language through immersion in three months. So if you want to study Italian, we'll send you data for three months. You can be somewhat fluent, all right? We pay 15,000, which is 5,000 a month, all right? But they want to include these in your application components. You're going to apply. So let's say you're going to go to Italy. You want to learn Italian, all right? Because maybe you want to work for an international organization and Italian is one of the languages you're going to have to be fluent in for this organization. For example, uh, such organizations exist in Geneva, Switzerland, where they have four recognized official languages. Italian is one of them. And they might say you have to be fluent in all four, English, French, German, and Italian. But you're not fluent in Italian yet. So you're going to go to Italy and learn it, right? So you have to indicate the language to study, purpose of the language to study, why, okay? What do you hope to gain from those three months? Where are you going? How long, duration, but also the extent of the training within that, the activities. What are you going to do to learn Italian? Your budget. How are you going to use the 15,000? Is it just living expenses? Right? What, what's all going to be entailed in that? Why you? Right? If they could only pick one of us and we all wanted to go to Italy to learn Italian for three months, why you? Out of all of us in this room, I want to go. Okay, I want to be paid. So you're going to learn a new language. How about you? Why you? Why not you? All right? This is very critical. A lot of people don't get funded because they cannot, for lack of a better word, sell themselves. Now, a lot of that, folks, is culture. I want to acknowledge that. Some of us come from cultures where we do not brag about who we are. It is absolutely against everything we've been taught. In the U.S. context, however, that goes against you. If you don't know why you're special, 
what your qualifications are, why you, nobody else will advocate for you. That's the problem. So a lot of graduate students who apply for fellowships come from the cult perspective of humility and humbleness. Okay, and I work every day with graduate students where I have to say, this is gonna be hard, <laughs> you know, but you cannot say things like, I hope to introduce a new theory. If I'm lucky, I will, right? If fate dictates, you can't say those words when you're applying for money. Because the reviewers are looking for people who are confident that they're going to achieve a certain goal. But if you come from a background of culture that says, no, you can't dictate fate, fate is fate, you either get it or not, you can't force something on you, then it's really hard for you to use those terms. Okay, so I don't want you to think like, well, I'll never be able to do that because I just don't know how to uh, promote myself. But it takes time. And it takes some change in your thinking in terms of what is the purpose of your writing. Okay, but I see it all the time. So, evaluation is the last component of a typical fellowship proposal where you have to convince people how you're going to assess that you have accomplished what you said you're going to accomplish. How are you going to know you're fluent in Italian? you just got to, what, translate something, right? So as you think about writing your proposal, I want you to think about these steps. That in a, in a typical, if it's just sort of like a generic fellowship application, these are the essential components that people are going to know about what you intend to do. So it's just a very simple, as you just get into the whole idea of proposal writing, I just want you to think about Pretending you're going to go somewhere and wanting to learn a language, and these are the things that the sponsor will want to know. Right? You can go deeper into how, again, to sell your idea. But before that, for those of us who are um, probably still in the process of thinking about applying for grants, just some simple things. Why apply for grants? Money, right? Who here doesn't need money? Okay, right. I need money. I do research on uh, multilingual writers, and we have to run around the university to find money for that. Um, I wanted to know how do people who speak different languages write in the English context in the, in the United States and at the University of Minnesota? Did a, um, good work on that. We published two uh, documents, one as an article and one as a book chapter. But, for us to do that, we have to have money. I have to have money to hire a postdoc to help me do it, and then to do the actual research. So you need money to do research. But it also helps you focus and communicate your ideas. If you really don't know, well, you know, I don't really know yet you know, who I want to interview. I don't really know, you know where I might go to get that data. If you're writing a proposal, you're going to have to know. Because reviewers are not just going to sit there and say, geez, I wonder where she's going. Right, you have to tell them, okay? But it also builds your confidence because you're more uh, able to communicate your ideas, but if, especially if you get the funding, then you know that your research, your work is fundable. People are interested. That gives you that motivation. It's professional development overall. It just builds on your um, CV because you know this. Right? More money, more money, more money. Somebody said, you know, that's not fair because people who don't get funded should be funded. Why do you always fund the ones who already have? Right? So the richer gets richer, and you know, those who don't get funded don't get funding. But why would people who get funding get more funding? Tell me. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to do more with their research. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, my ability and credentials for the community is class. It shows promise. It yeah. shows that you have show, you have proven yourself once. Yeah, it shows you proven yourself once. You may have also um, not been able to take the traditional route of the technicalities or adaptation to modern property. So you have the opportunity to actually practice those things. Yeah. So, so I'm you repeating your answer so that it's recorded. Yeah. yeah. So you've had practical practicality to actually see how it works in real life. Um, another reason that someone who reviews proposals is um, trust. If I give you $60,000, how do I know you're not just going to slack and throw the money around and really not accomplish anything? What does that look like for my organization? What does that say about me as a reviewer trusting you with money? That I don't even know if you can handle it. So for those who, if you're in psychology, which is you know, social science, and if you're in a you know, lab working with kids or something like that, it's a vulnerable population. I need to be able to trust that you are somebody that can be trusted. So that's why money gets more money, because it's about that, your credibility, your credentials, and the trust that the organization is placing on you. So we always encourage graduate students to start early in applying for funds. And even if you don't get it, you know the process, you know the experience. So the next time you apply, most likely you should get it because you've gone through the first process. So. Where do you begin searching for funding? Um, workshops. The graduate school, we have um, all kinds of external and internal um, funding. University libraries, they do a lot of workshops on um, looking for funding, searching for funding. You would ask your department, advisors, DGS, peers. The website for the VP for Research, they have uh, opportunities. Graduate school fellowship office, if, if you have not, got the Graduate School Fellowship Office, you must go there and look at their website because we have it categorized in internal competitions, just for U of M students, and external funding. A ton of resources, I can't even begin to tell you. Okay, so on a weekend or when you have a break, go through the Graduate School Fellowship Office website and make sure you find something that would be relevant to you. And we'll go uh, talk about that, but also just do online searches, key searches for the kind of research area that you're in and who's funding what. Okay, something might have just come up um, recently and you want to make sure you're aware of it, okay? The usual process is that you start applying within the University of Minnesota in terms of fellowships and scholarships and so on, and then you branch out. Now, for some people that may not be the case, some may already get external fellowships even before they come to the university. But why would we suggest that you start, say, at your departmental, and then college, university-wide, and then outside the university? Why is that sort of a natural process? So less competition, you know who um, you're applying to. What else? Yes. You're building that money system, so you get more money for it. Yeah. You're building money gets money. So for example, if I'm with, um, um, let's say, uh, General Mills Foundation, if I see that this student has never gotten anything from their college, their department, the University of Minnesota doesn't think this person is fundable, why would I? It's that simple, okay? So that's why at the university we try hard to get as many fellowships as possible for you to apply and compete for because we know that once you get those, you'd be more likely to get external fellowships. And that's good for your professional development, but also saves us money, right? Because then we don't have to fund you, okay? So it's really important if you are in the process of thinking about where to apply, look locally, look at the university. For those of you who are a little bit advanced, how many of you um, have gotten like the doc doctoral dissertation fellowship, DDF, anybody? What about the IDF, interdisciplinary doctoral fellowship? Okay, these are university-wide fellowships. Um, and if you're a doctoral student and you're in your year four or five, you 
would compete within your department first to represent your department at the university wide to get these fellowships. But we're going to look at some examples in a minute of the DDF and the IDF fellowships, okay? And there are types of funding, of course, here we have at the U, departmental, collegiate, and university-wide. University-wide, of course, would be more competitive because there are more people applying. But you also have external um, that fall within the government type of fellowship. Now, unfortunately, international students would not be eligible for most governmentally funded um, scholarships or fellowships, but there are foundation, nonprofit ones, and private companies and family. Okay. Any questions about types of funding or where to find funding? So is it a plus if you did apply to, for example, the DDF? So um, I got nominated, but then I got rejected from them. Mm -hmm. Is that at all something that you could say when you come to some stage? Or? Yeah, you could say you're nominated yeah, by your department. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, for some people, not actually getting that to a prize itself, they feel like that might be a negative, but it really depends on who your audience is. Right. Um, there are people who are called um, uh, honorable mention. In other words, they did not get the actual um, award, the fellowship on a national level, but they were the next in line. That's called honorable mention, right? Some people do put that on, on their um, CVs and resumes. I've seen it. But um, they do that if, for example, they're applying for another fellowship. So they want people to know that they, they weren't just another applicant that didn't get funded. Um, everybody knows when, you know, in, in the granting world, they know what an honorable mention is. It, it's when if the person who was awarded declines, you are the next in line. But that means it was so close, like could have been you. Um, and I've been in a lot of review panels where it is that close. You know, so there's usually a, an even, num I'm sorry, an odd number. So there's a tiebreaker, and sometimes like three to two. That's it, okay, two to one. And so it could have gone either way, uh, but we'll talk about reviewers in a minute. Okay, so the proposal itself, and some of you, like you said, you've already applied and you've gotten. So what's the first thing you do when you think about applying for a fellowship? Any, any thoughts, any suggestions? There are, People here who already know this, yeah. Gaps in the literature. Can you say more about that? So where is there a need for more exploration? Yep. Need more exploration for the topic you're going to explore. What else? So think of the vacuum cleaner, right? Why do you need a new vacuum cleaner? New type of vacuum cleaner. You have to know what's out there already. What else? Yeah. Okay, so find the fit for the organization that's uh, offering the funding. Before you do any of that, and it's probably along the lines of what you just said, look to see what has already been funded. It is the sort of most intuitive thing, like, well, if I know what they're looking for, then I can probably write my proposal in a similar manner, right? Um, so to make sure that you're not completely off of what they're looking for. So this is the easiest way to sort of think about what, what kind of research do they fund? How are people writing? Are they, is it very heavy marketing? Is it um, you know, third person, first person? How are people applying for these things? And so like I, I told you, part of my uh, process when teaching or uh, presenting is I show you examples of what's been done so it's easier for you to conceptualize where you are um, in reference to what people are putting out there people skip this and I don't understand why some people apply for things they're not even eligible for they missed a huge piece something like you can't graduate before December 2019. 
They went through all of that work and then realized later that they can't even get. Or we don't fund people in education. And you're running around trying to um, get people you know, to uh, write letters for you and so on. It's very, very uh, disappointing. So please make sure that you read carefully. I mean, I've, I've seen it too many times to know that this happens. And a part of it is that when people apply for fellowships, sometimes they're applying for more than one at a time. So maybe they're applying for four or five at a time and they're not paying attention to every single uh, criteria and guidelines, okay? Um, know your audience. This is really, really critical. Now, some people say, well, I, they won't tell me who the reviewers are. They're, gonna, they're not gonna say it's Bob Smith, right? No, you don't have to have people's names, but you can ask for what field are they in? Is it very interdisciplinary where there can be people from English and psychology and geography, or is it more, mostly people in the sciences? You can ask that of program officers. Those are the people who coordinate the fellowship. So you can ask as, you know, as much as they're willing to give, right? So try to get a sense of, you know, is it faculty? Is it um, staff or the students? You can ask the general uh, questions, but without uh, them having to reveal names, which they won't. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go to the foundation and say, do you have examples of previous proposals? And a lot of times that they do. And so, for example, for some of the things that I'm going to show you here, I just went to the source and I said, I'm trying to encourage graduate students to uh, apply for fellowships, maybe yours. Can you show me successful examples? And they'll point you to a website or they'll ask somebody who's done a really great job. Um, the other thing, too, is that if you are good friends or you have peers who applied for fellowships that did a really good job and they got them, ask them if they're willing to share their material with you. They already have the fellowship, right? So they're not going to get it again, so you're not competing against them. And so um, for some of the things that I have here, that's what I did. I went to the student and I said, can I get your um, personal statement or your purpose of study or your research experience or whatever so I can share with other people so they know what this is like. And they're like, absolutely. Okay? But the idea is that you need to think about how to get your hands on those examples so that you're not working in the dark like, well, maybe they want this or maybe they want that. It makes a huge difference to say this is what they have funded. Okay? Um, technical terms and jargons. A lot of times the people, the panel that people uh, that will be assembled are people not in your field. They're educated, um, intellectual, academics, professionals, or whatever, but they're not going to understand your acronyms and your you know, specific ways to talk about your research um, outside your field. And this takes a lot of skill to know how to talk about your work without using those um, disciplinary words. So seeking feedback is really, really important. When my uh, colleague and I um, drafted our uh, book chapter, we made a huge mistake. We were, um, now it's a book chapter, before it was an article. We were, we were um, trying to sell it to um, the International Journal of Education. And our readers <laughs> were people in humanities. They were writing studies experts. They were not education people. So they understood the article. They were like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, go for it. We submitted it to the journal and it was declined. They said that our notes chapter was longer than the actual, you know, the, 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 the notes and the footnotes and the, the bibliography was longer than the article itself. Um, and they, they just tore it apart. We were just absolutely devastated. And I said, you know what? That was so silly. Why did we give it to writers, you know, in English and writing studies? That's not the audience that's going to read it. That, that's not the, the um, uh, review panel. The review panel are education people. So we should have given it to our colleagues in education because it's a journal of education. Duh. I mean, it was like, what's our problem, right? Um, so when we rewrote it, then we submitted it um, to different people different types of readers, and then it was approved as a book chapter because we got the right people this time. So lesson learned in that 
you are comfortable with the kind of people in your group. Like these are the people who are, who are not going to give me really harsh, rude feedback because they like me. But those are not the people that you want to critique your work because they may not be in the field that's really looking at your work, okay? And so you want to have a sort of a, a diverse, expanded network of support to look at your proposal so that you can get those really critical feedback like, this doesn't make any sense. Why would someone in education understand what disciplining graduate students need? That was a big word that we used in our research, disciplining graduate students. So when we submitted it to the International Journal, like, what the heck does that mean? Like disciplining, like, like disciplining children? Like, what are you talking about? They just tore that up completely. We were like, oh, how did I understand that? But the humanities writing people, they totally understood that. You know, they understood it as telling graduate students this is how things are done in the academy. That's disciplining them. Okay? But education, they didn't know what that meant. Okay? So make sure that when you write your proposal, your draft, you give it to people from a wide range of perspective so that you don't waste your time applying to something and they have no clue what this means to them. Okay? Um, you have to start early. People said writing a fellowship proposal is almost like uh, writing a um, manuscript for publishing. You know, three months at least. You had a question? Yeah, so like from the same point, you just say that avoid too much technical terminology because maybe it's just a good balance. But like sometimes your work is important because you go into the details. Like, do you think why it's important? Because other people have done it. But if you are not in the field of your study, so you don't try to use too much technical terms or go into too much detail. But if you abstract like, too much from, you know, the important things that you've done, then it's sort of it's also hard to sell how important the work is. Right. So like, how about you get like balance between this uh, couple of things? Right, so the question is, how do you balance between not being too technical with your work, the jargon, but also explaining your work so that it's not lost uh, on those who uh, might understand the significance. So that's what I said, that's when you need to have people look at what you're writing because your critique uh, process will help people say, you know what, this is too simplistic. I've, I've done that where I look at a student's uh, research and I'm like, well, it's not really telling you what you're doing. You're just telling me what the purpose is, but I don't know what you're actually doing, right? What questions are you asking? What methods are you using? So it takes time and um, skill to be able to give value to your work without getting into the technical area. And there's a way to do that. Um, but if you get too lost in the technical, the committee wouldn't understand anything. Okay. So we can talk, um, briefly about that later, but what I, what I want you to think about is begin with a draft of what you think might work, show it to someone in your field and outside your field, get feedback from them. If they're saying this is too technical, I don't understand this, but I want to make sure that people know the, uh, integrity of this work without making it sound very superficial. That's how you get your feedback, okay? So, proofreading is really, really important. People will throw out your application if you have a lot of errors. We have done that in really committees that I've served on because it's too distracting and it makes us wonder whether you really cared enough about the process. So. Um, the thing that really gets a lot of people is the um, automatic replacement of words, right? Like um, um, you, you, you go throughout the document and say replace, 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 right? But if that word is misspelled, it's misspelled throughout the document. We see that all the time. So when you are proofing your document, make sure that whatever you are asking the computer to automatically replace is spelled correctly. And it's also the right word, okay? So the very embarrassing thing that happened, but this one proposal, the writer wanted to use the word public. Okay. And did like, you know, replace all with what? Pubic. Yeah. Okay. Very, very, very embarrassing for this person. So I bring that up because I see it too many times. He's okay, replace all, then zoom. It's all over the place, and they never check to see. So it happens, all right? 
Um, please don't do this. Do not submit on the day of the application deadline. Why? Why? Although people do it, that's why there are deadlines, because you can still submit. The server can crash, okay? You could be in a car accident, heaven forbid, and you can't get to the computer to fix them, or you can do it online. Something might go wrong. So I never ever submit anything important or major on the day, because you can still call the next day and say, can you please make sure that you got it? Um, when students ask me for a recommendation, I never submit it on the last day. Never. I would never take that chance on a student's life. Okay? It is always on my calendar. If this is the deadline for the whatever fellowship, my letter gets in at least two days ahead. Because something can happen. And you have no proof that says, my, you know, your site was down or my computer was broken or something like that. No. So don't take a chance. If, if you've done all that work, and you're going to wait till one minute before the deadline, um, I don't think that it's worth all that stress and pain, OK? Uh, what's going on? OK. So begin with the end in mind. On any proposal, you have to begin with, what is it that I want to do again? Oh, I want to be fluent in Italian in three months. Why? Oh, because so on and so forth. Okay. I want you to look at the word result. That is what reviewers are looking for. Now, you might be in humanity and like, well, in humanities, we don't really measure anything. Like, we don't really measure results. Yes, you do. If you're doing text analysis, if you're doing uh, any kind of immersion, any kind of ethnographic research, there is some way for you to know that you have accomplished something. Otherwise, how do you know that you're moving forward on your research? So what do you hope will result from the project or research for which you're seeking funding? That's very, very important. It could be something like, I will be um, more able to research archives in Greece if I you know, have the skill. So there has to be some actual uh, tangible product from having gone that funding. Who cares? Again, why do I think I am the one of everyone in this room who should go to Italy? Who cares that it should be me? So you have to ask that question. Okay. Who thinks that your work is important, and why is it important? So just in terms of like, these are the things that reviewers are looking for. I want you to think of this as your, I'm sorry, I don't know why that bar is there, but um, this is your thought process, the four what's. What is the issue? Okay, so more a broad societal issue. So what? Okay, now we're narrowing it. And I'll show an example in a minute. What are you doing about it? Where do you fit into all this? And what is it supposed what is supposed to happen after you've been involved in this? So it's what is the problem? So what? Now what? What are you doing about it? For what? How does this benefit society? If you think of all of the work that you do in terms of your abstract writing, any kind of elevator speech you have to do, any kind of presentation or anything, in those four what's, it helps you think succinctly about your work. Okay? So it's kind of like a hourglass model, broad, narrow, broad. If you can't convince people why this is important to the regular person run, you know, walking around the street, nobody is going to think it's important. It has to be applicable in some way, translational in some way. So let's get an, uh, an example of smoking. Okay? 
What is the issue? It's a societal issue. 30% of teenagers, meaning age 14 to 16, in the US smoke at least one pack of cigarettes a day, leading to lung cancer and other health problems. So you provide some data. In Minneapolis, the number is 20%. So that's the issue. We have teenagers who are smoking. So, like, so what? Teenagers are smoking. They do it all the time. From 2000 to 2017, the Minnesota Department of Health has implemented the No Puff anti smoking program for Hennepin and Ramsey County residents. So there's something that somebody has done. Something was done about this. The literature review that your colleague there talked about. What, what's been done about it? Well, here's something we're doing in Minnesota, 17 years. Yeah. So what are you doing about it? Well, through surveys, focus groups, and individual interviews, I'll evaluate the effectiveness of the program and make recommendations for improvement. So you're going to get involved with the NOPOC program and make sure that this is working. Or why it's not working, or how to make it work better. That's specific to you. What is the broader impact? For what? what why are we doing this? Well, to reduce risk of lung cancer and health problems. So you can go even longer for the for what? Okay? So in this example, uh, the assumption is there is an intervention already mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. So in case where it's a new thing, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody has done this or nobody has done this in this subset right. example of the population. Yeah. Then in the so what section, is it like discussing why any intervention would be important or is it a missing section? Is yeah. it of the or right. if, there, if there isn't any intervention. intervention. Yeah. Well, even better. If there is no intervention, you can say there is to date, nothing being done about this issue, could be anything, homelessness, whatever, and I am willing, interested, to step forward and prov provide that intervention. The issue is that if there is intervention being done and you did not mention it, that's the problem. That's why you have to know your literature. You have to know, like I said about the vacuum cleaner, right? What's already been done? Who's doing what? Because it's offensive to people to say, well, they didn't do anything about this issue, and maybe there are three programs already in place about it. You just didn't know. Okay? So if, for sure, nothing has been done, or things have been done but it hasn't been working, you can step up and say, I will do X, Y, and Z. Okay? So, uh, but the important thing is to, to, to know the... Um, the literature, the research about that area. That happens a lot too, where I was on a committee and some a student uh, applied for a fellowship and a faculty who actually did intervention in the area that the student was saying there was nothing has been done. The faculty was like, oh my goodness, we've done a lot of work on this and you know he just didn't realize it, right? So make sure that you, you don't um, miss uh, these important work that's being done uh, about your research. Okay, so proposal components that some foundations might ask you for. A one-sentence description, okay, of your work. Um, an executive summary, the four what's, or the, they also call this the abstract. Um, introduction, problem statement, rationale, okay. Current initiatives. That's the so what. The research objectives or the now what, okay? What are you doing about it? Um, expected measurable outcomes, like what you hope will happen. Again, people aren't gonna give you money if they don't know what they can get for the money. And yes, it's not their money, it's not their personal money, but they have been um, assigned as stewards of somebody else's money, okay? And for what? Why does what? What is the benefit to society? Now, humanities folks always have a problem with this with this benefit to society, because what does studying Shakespeare have anything to do with society? Is it more English for more English? Is it more math for math? You know, why do I have to prove? Um, but 
there are ways that you can say how this will either advance society in general or your field. And that is the broader impact, okay? So <clears throat> if you're in the humanities and you're wondering how does this apply to you, you can also think about it as the society in your academic discipline. How does studying in England, looking at archives, learning about Shakespeare, Shakespeare's life and his, um, his uh, history uh, further the work that you're doing in your field, right? Valuation, um, how do you know that you have accomplished your objectives? Yes? I have a question about that last bullet. I wonder about balancing, like when I write a proposal before what being, like being an aspiration, you know, like the smoking, like and this could like say cancer rates when like maybe the real impact is like this might like make the study like somewhat better for like emergency or population in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And whether it's better to write the proposal with kind of like a big aspirational for what to society or to be just like keep it to what you can deliver mm -hmm. so that it doesn't look like you're mm -hmm. out of touch. Right. So <laughs> the question is for the for what, how broad do you want to um, mention uh, will be the <clears throat> impact of society. And I would say it, it depends on the work that you're doing. So if it is about the smoking, for example, you could say that the the impact would be to help um, reduce the number of teenagers who smoke in, in Minneapolis and, um, if possible, share the results with other cities doing similar efforts. So the idea is so you're not going to say that you're exactly going to do this, but by knowing that this helped in Minneapolis, that might help others do something similar. Because the idea is that, in, in essence, we want teenagers to stop smoking, not just in Minneapolis, right? We want them to stop smoking all over the world. So if this one little study might be able to contribute to what happens around the US and then maybe around the world, that's already a seed that you're planting, OK? But <coughs> so it, it takes practice to say, am I impacting just this local thing? But you can also say, and this might help ripple, might be a ripple effect of what might happen other places. So if you were able to even like publish something around your research that others not to read, that might help reduce the uh, percentage across the, the country or the world. Sometimes we write proposals where <clears throat> to study or evaluate an existing intervention already. Mm -hmm. So in that case, what should the evaluation part of this be because the goal of these is to evaluate something mm -hmm. not to intervene something is already in place right right it's right so are you applying for a grant to evaluate something i'm applying for a grant that will, money will be used to evaluate, evaluate something. something right exactly all right so if you're applying for a grant where you're going to say i'm going to e evaluate um, um a child obesity program mm -hmm. that's taking place in uh, st louis park okay is hypothetically you still have to have all of these things. Yeah. You have to have your objectives of how are you going to evaluate and how would you know that you have accomplished the evaluation process, right? So anything that you're applying for, you have to have these. You still have to evaluate your evaluation process because otherwise how do I know that you have effectively evaluated that program? How do I know as the person who's giving me the money? I'm just giving you like $70,000. I need to know that you evaluated that program. So any kind of proposal, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're building a program, you're evaluating it, whatever, you have to convince people that you have objectives and this is how you know you met those objectives. Okay, so evaluation studies always talks about evaluating your evaluation. I have a question for like the, the fake social sciences. The fake so social sciences. I'm a social scientist, mm -hmm. but I don't have any real world application okay. of what I do, right? And I think a lot of people have that to where your contributions to theory, not to yeah. the problem at hand, right. and the empirical case study is just what it is. And so I'm interested in like, yeah, how do you translate that into something that's like an actual benefit rather <laughs> than just benefiting yourself in literature and stuff? 
Yeah. So, you know, I think with that, um, almost like in the humanities or the fake social sciences, yeah. that it's probably going to be a discussion around how is this benefiting the discipline in general. And depending on who the funding source is, um, you would say, so if you, if you got funding to do this work, this would lead to what in the discipline in the academy. Because for people who are in English, for example, where you're studying British literature, I was an English major, one of my majors in college, it was really hard to say more English for more English. It was, you know, and so I had to change my major because I couldn't really explain, um, you know, my love for British literature or, you know, Western literature in a way that made sense to uh, other people who didn't, is this more English for, you know, for more English. Um, people in math also have the same circumstance where they're, they're studying very high theory concept math, math, and sometimes they can say, well, this is how we're able to send people to the moon, right? Like, it's math, if you saw the Hidden Figures movie. Um, so there, sometimes there is a way to talk about it um, that goes beyond just the discipline, and then there are times when it's probably advancing the discipline. Somebody had a... I was going to say, so for something like uh, theory, you can also talk about how it can be applied to research that can be applied to real world. So it doesn't mean to mm -hmm. kind of, like you said, if you're not going to say what I did, you know, like say about a teenager, I'm going to do that forever. But it's like this contributes to a body of knowledge that does this, and so we're talking about Right. So that's right. So it's in your field contributing to some idea, some uh, process, some theory that someone else can take to a more practical level. Okay, I want to make sure that we have time to look at um, the, the uh, proposals. Um, but remember about why you. This is very, very important. This is about what training have you had, what mentoring, what other fellowships, what experiences have you had that makes me want to give you $100,000. Because if all of us can uh, talk about our research in all of the four what's you talked about, but you can convince the donor that you are the right person to do this research, you're not gonna get the money, okay? How are you connected to the community that you're going to uh, do research, for example? Do you have the language skills to do this work? Do you have the lab skills, if you're in a social science that has labs? Do you have the uh, archival uh, training to do this? Okay, so it's very important to look at why you, all right? Budget. If, if there is a budget for you to actually do research, travel, do whatever, you have to convince people that you have been very thorough and very frugal, not just spending money because it's there, but that at the end of the program, you're not going to have a whole bunch of money left over that they should have given to somebody else, or that you are in the red you spent all their money and you actually uh, under budgeted. So think about all the ways that someone um, would build that trust. And another component for most proposals is a personal statement. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Personal statement, a lot of you probably heard of what that is. Personal statement is part of why you, part of your qualifications, but it's, um, why you care about this work, what, why are you invested in it? So if you're probably doing research on, let's say, cancer, um, from like a psychological perspective, maybe you knew someone who was affected by cancer. So you're very close, and this is something that you really want to commit your life to, okay? For example, um, letter of recommendation, doesn't appear. There it is. Who else says it should be you? That is what a letter recommendation is, in a nutshell. Who else believes that you have the experience, you have the know-how, that of all the people in this room, you should be the only one to get the money? Okay? So if you just think about, and I'll send this PowerPoint to you so you have it. So if you think about what are like, you know, if you were to pick any fellowship off the internet and apply for, I would say 90% of the time they would have these things so when you think about promoting your research, selling your research, selling yourself, selling your experience, I want you to think about these elements already. 
And for some students, what they do is you sort of start drafting these elements about their research. And then when they see a fellowship that they really like, then they sort of tailor it based on the audience. So they're not starting from scratch, like, oh, I got to apply for this fellowship. They already have something in their sort of, you know, drawer of um, proposal writing elements that they pull out and they tweak based on the fellowship. Okay, so um, I think um, we'll go through this quickly. So here's an example of a foundation that says provide a compelling one sentence description of your proposed project and target population. Okay, so this is the, sort of the one sentence description. Reduce the sexual exploitation of girls in Alameda County by providing mental health and support services through direct representation, community collaboration, and the creation of a girls court. So this is someone, this is an actually, uh, actually funded proposal um, for a, a sponsor out in California. So this person said reduce the sexual exploitation of girls in Alameda County by providing them men providing mental health support services through direct representation, community collaboration, and the creation of a girl's court. One sentence description. Now, begin with a verb. Very important. The result, okay? You have all kinds of verbs you can use for any kind of um, proposal. But to be passive and, you know, not again, um, strong or purposeful in what you're saying, it conveys lack of confidence, but with a strong verb, okay, reduce, eliminate, um, conduct, so they explore. Okay, so find action verbs that work with the kind of work that you're doing. Okay, so for this person, it was, uh, what is the issue, the broad society? Despite community and government efforts, the number of children who are commercially sexually exploited in Alameda County is growing. Most victims are young girls that have run away, many from foster care. That's the problem. Okay? So what? The project, this project will link victims of child sexual exploitation to mental health care and community support in Alameda County to get them out of detention and into safe placements. That's the intervention. And this is what she's doing about it. As part of my project, I will provide direct representation in matters involving Medicaid, special education, and child welfare. I will add an anti-trafficking component to the existing juvenile mental health court by re recruiting sexual exploitation advocates as full partners in the court. As the project progresses, I will work with local agencies and community advocates to develop a girls' court modeled on the JMHC's multidisciplinary collaborative approach. Very direct. Okay, for what? By linking victims of child exploitation to services and support, fewer girls will be detained and returned to life on the streets. Very simple, but thorough. Okay, so again, we started broad, narrow, broad. Those are the four what's. Okay, so um, it's an example again the DDF. If you've never applied for it, it's something that you're interested in. The DDF. Um, says that you have to have a maximum of three pages. This is the statement of research that you have to submit. Single space, 12 point font, the working title, 100 word abstract, dark and free, non-specialist. And the summary, the student statement highlights the students so which contributions to the research, um, significance, and so on. And then specialized terminology must be defined. OK, so let's look at someone's um, abstract. This is someone in history. And the abstract is about the empire of cities, the logistics of state power in the Roman Republic's empire. We understand, I'm bolding the verbs. Look at the difference. We understand very little about how the Roman Republic created its empires despite numerous studies examining why Rome expanded and how that expansion reshaped the city states institutions. In my dissertation, I combine textual and archaeological evidence with a digital methodology to investigate the creation of the Roman Empire. This approach reveals right, the relationship between the emergence of cities and Roman expansion across the Western Mediterranean. I argue, excellent verbs, that Rome relied on a network of urban communities 
as the principal building blocks for its empire, which gave it the infrastructure to control the whole Mediterranean world. No jargon. I can understand that without even being in history. And it's been years since that history 101. Okay. So um, now this student, this is how they outlined their um, DDF proposal because the DDF will not give you a template of here are the headings you have to have. They purposefully do not give you that because they want to know if you know how to write. Okay, does that make sense? If we tell you exactly what to put in your statement of research, then all of you will have an equally fair chance. But we want you to tell us what's important about your research. So there's no template. You just write. They tell you like what they want to know, but there's no headings. So this person used these headings. Then an abstract, a project description, state of the field and contribution. Okay, so you see where they're going. Sources and methodology, and plan for completion and career goals. Yeah. That's where the previous people go. What if the, the measurable discovery, the grand scale of the mm -hmm. abstract? Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's where the science will be. Yeah, it's a very really yeah. visible thing. Right. right. Concept. That's where the social science will be. Because mm -hmm. you won't have a really visible picture. Yeah, you know, I disagree with that. A lot of humanity health science say we don't have any outcomes. Why are you doing the research? Right? If you don't know that you are actually progressing and you're going to have more, have more data, have more experience, have more skills, have more opportunities to interact with whatever, with, with the text, there's no reason for you to do your research if it's not going to result in something, right? There is a way to say it. It depends on what it is. So for this student, um, we don't have time to go through the whole proposal, but the student was um, proposing um, ways to expand the work that she's doing to lead to something that's more applicable within the history um, discipline. So these proposals are going to be available for you online. So you can look at the whole thing. But what I want you to get from, from what I showed you um, is how to use verbs to strengthen your application, how not to use jargon, so anybody can understand. I argued that Rome relied on a network of urban communities. So there is something that she is building, he is building on for this um, uh, proposal that will allow them to learn more about their work. Yes? Of the proposal, or I guess, you know, how obvious yeah. be right? It depends. Now, some propose some foundations will say we want you to head, head the heading to be benefits to society. For in the sciences, like NSF, they actually use the word uh, broader impact, and you just you know put all the bullets. Um, but it, if if your work is um, engaged in the community, we say uh, you, know, so you can say. Um, you know, preventing child obesity broadly or preventing child obesity in the United States. If that is a heading that's more um, catchy, more uh, persuasive than broader impact, then go for it. If they don't dictate how you should put a heading on something, then be creative. Because when I look through the DDF application, there are people who are really creative about the, you know, the ending is um, the broader impact, but they have a way of saying it, something like um, preparing students for the future. Right. But without having a specific example of your research, how can you say, well, this is how you should set it. But if you're, for example, working with uh, teachers, if you're cooking instruction, and you are doing teacher training, and w one way to get a broad impact is improving future teacher training. That's already talking about broad impact in the future. Right. But you're not saying that. But it's implied that this is about future and broader impact. Okay, I would say be creative because with proposals you have a word limit and you want to maximize the impact of your words. So choose your words wisely. That's what I said about using verbs so that if it's just generic broader impact, if there's a way for you to say it better, like you know, preparing future professionals you know, you know, with um, stronger skills or something, that is broader impact. Okay, so at this point, um, there was another one I wanted to look at, but 
Um, I want us to uh, look at personal statements. It's your background and how it relates to the project, why you're uniquely qualified, and why now. Please don't forget to address now, right? You could apply for this next year. You could apply for this, could have applied for this last year. Why now? So I review fellowships for Institute for Advanced Study, and there's a, a three of us who look at it. And we also, why is this person applying for this now? And they answer it. Say, this is the time that I'm most poised to get this fellowship because it will allow me to, to do more writing, and then next year I'll be in Japan or South Africa to do field work. So I need this now and not next year. So if you are able to articulate why now, that's going to be more convincing than, well, just, you know, give it to me if you think I need it now. No, you tell me if you need it now and why you need it now. Okay, look in terms of your, um, your year, time to degree, and so on. Yes? Is it okay to be explicit um, that you're applying now because you are developing an application proposal or certification or postdoc and you need to discuss about that? Yeah, you can be explicit. Like, how does this tie in to the rest of your academic and professional goals? That's what a personal statement does. It helps pu pull together um, what, why you're interested in the research, why you, why now, uh, why the location if you're going somewhere, why, why can't you do this in Brazil, why do you, you know, or why can't you do this in the United States, why do I have to fund you $50,000 more to do this in uh, Okinawa, whatever the research is, why can't you look at archives here in, in Minneapolis, why do I have to send you to Chicago, that's more money, okay? So you have to justify each of these points. So at this point, um, I want um, to give you some examples of, um, I think what we're going to do is, um, just take one and pass it around. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so just make sure that it goes around over here. So there are three, three over here. Okay. Yeah. Let me get my microphone. Go ahead. Um, if, let's say you're applying for a $10,000 grant, mm -hmm. and you organize your budget in your meticulous and approval, and you come up with like 8700 do you ask for that amount, or do you still ask for Okay. The question is, if the budget that you're allowed is 10000 but you're being frugal, and you actually come up with a budget of about 8000 do you ask for 10000 um, so I would, I would say you ask for what you need. Do not bloat your number just because you can. Like, I have 10,000, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to use it up. Because they'll figure that out. Um, at the same time, don't be so frugal that you don't actually have the money that you need. So I would say sort of, um, uh, budget on the higher end without looking like you're trying to fill up 10,000 because you're saying I need a ticket to fly from um, you know, if you're in Italy from you know, Rome to Milan and I think it's going to be this amount but it actually ends up being higher then you're left with you know paying for that difference so I would say don't be so frugal make sure that you're within the range of what that's going to cost same thing if you get an equipment if you um, need to stay uh, lodging somewhere in um, 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 you know, Zimbabwe, whatever, I'm not really sure, but the range of the, um, the hotel or the hostels are this. So I, I would say go to the higher end without looking like you're just trying to fill 10,000. They will figure that out and won't trust you, right? Other questions? Is it weird if you fall short? Is it weird if you fall short? No, I, I don't think it's weird. I think there, um, there are people depending on where they're going, it's just going to be more expensive than where you're going. They will also take that into consideration. Um, I've approved grants for, you know, students um, studying 
or doing research abroad and then realizing they don't really need all the money that I'm offering. Um, in some cases, I'm willing to even fund them more because they're you know, less money. I can give more money um, to more students, right? So I would just say, um, be honest, but make sure you're not under budgeting yourself as well because you can't go back and say, oh, by the way, I need that extra 2,000. No, that's already gone. Right? So, you know, take care of yourself, but um, don't blow. Okay, um, I want you to look at these proposals and um, read, let's start with um, the, uh, does everybody have what we gave out? Okay, okay, so the four predoctoral example proposed plan of graduate study. Okay, the one that starts with the 11 billion annual market. Anybody have that one? I think this one was well written um, plan of graphic study. It starts on, on one side of the page is the 11 billion annual market of plasma pharmaceuticals. Do okay, you have that one? That one did not get around for pre that Which is that table? Yeah, like that's the one. It's a one pager, two sides. 11 billion annual market of plasma pharmaceuticals. Okay. So I want you to um, take a good look at this one as you go home um, because this student did a really good job of not making her work, explaining her work, very jargon. Uh, jargon. She was able to really make anybody understand, if you understand. Um, work surrounding uh, pharmacy and health. I think all of us can relate to that. You know, all of us have had some health issues in the past. So um, I provide this for you so that you can take your time to read it. Again, it's about knowing what has been funded and seeing yourself applying for it with what's already been submitted by other students. So we have a lot of examples there that you can draw from. Um, there are others um, that we dig out. You have the one that says um, sample application 2010 equal justice work scholarships competition. Okay. Nate, did the materials get around all the way? I want to make sure you get them before you leave because this is important for you to get a sense of how people are writing to get their money, okay? So if you have the ones that says sample application, provide a compelling one sentence description of your proposed project. Represent Spanish speaking tenants in foreclosed rental units in order to protect their rights and well-being preserve the value of the properties, and help stabilize the surrounding community. In a nutshell, I mean, it's so complete and compelling. Who doesn't want to fund something that talks about stabilizing the community and helping Spanish-speaking tenants who are in the foreclosed rental units? But if you had written that a different way, somebody would say, well, you know, if it didn't talk about protecting rights, if it didn't address well-being, um, represent, that's a verb, it's a very important verb, okay? So I want you to sort of think about everything we talked about, the, you know, the four what's, the general components of a proposal for any fellowship that you'd be applying for, and using action words. So um, reviewers, and I'm gonna end soon, are not experts in your field. They are rock star people. They're busy. They don't sit around and wait for you to apply for something like you're hoping you're going to be applying. They have limited patience. They're skeptical because they have to screen hundreds of people. But they also want to be your advocate. They want you to succeed and get funded. So the idea is to under make it easy for them uh, to understand your work. Why people aren't funded? They're not eligible. Okay? They 
don't have the uh, required ability or the experience. The project doesn't um, fit what they're doing. The methods, the originality is unclear, does not seem feasible. Too ambitious. The proposal is missing things. Um, you know, you know the, the headings are, are not uh, appropriate. There are no headings. I saw some DDF proposals with no headings at all. Just huge text, three, seven paragraphs with no headings. Couldn't read it. Um, inconsistent messages throughout. Not really sure what they want to do. And the budget is unjustified, too large um, for the funder. So we're going to end here because we have someone, right, from Center for Writing um, who's going to talk. We're partnering COGS and the grad school and the Center for Writing. We're partnering to help you apply, encourage you to apply fellowships. So I'd ask our colleague to talk a little bit about what the Center for Writing is doing. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Gentleman. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in the theoretical gas department here. Um, I also work as a writing consultant at Student Writing Support. Uh, so just out of curiosity, how many of you know about Student Writing Support?